Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us. We'll kick off now. Thank you for braving the cold and the long walk from the main hall to join us this morning. My name is Aaron Martin, and I'll be chairing today's panel on converging norms and emerging markets, which will explore data protection developments across Asia. Um, very briefly, I'm a postdoctoral fellow at the Tilburg Institute for Law, Technology, and Society in the Netherlands. Uh, we have an esteemed panel of experts and policymakers joining us today from India, Indonesia, South Korea, and Singapore. I'll briefly, briefly introduce our panelists before we commence the discussion. First, it's our honor to have Mr. Belor Srikishna joining us today. He's a, an Indian jurist and a retired judge of the Supreme Court of India. He's had an illustrious legal career. Most notably, in 2018, he led a committee that delivered a report and a draft bill that formed the core of India's emerging data protection regime and has been highly influential in ongoing debates in India about the value of privacy. He holds a bachelor's degree in science and postgraduate degrees in law. Ms. Clarice Giron is a senior fellow at the Asian Business Law Institute in Singapore, where she leads a landmark project on the convergence of data privacy laws in Asia. She's the editor of a unique compendium of reports on the regulation of international data transfers in 14 Asian jurisdictions. Prior to this, she was the head of Keneal's Department of International Affairs, then counselor to Keneal's president. She studied in Paris, Oxford, and holds a PhD from Tilburg University in the Netherlands. Mr. Hyunik Kim joined the Personal Information Protection Commission in Korea in December 2011, and currently carries out tasks with regard to international relations within the organization. He's also been nominated and is active as a GPIN champion. Prior to this, he's held various positions at public agencies such as the Civil Service Commission and Seoul Metropolitan Government. He holds an LLB from Songgang University. Dr. Sinta Dawi Rosati is an associate professor in law at the Faculty of Law at the University of Padjanjaran in Indonesia. She specializes in international law and information technology law and data privacy. Her research areas include the regulation of privacy, data protection, consumer privacy in the financial sector and medical sector and telecommunications sector, and the issues of privacy with respect to government legal enforcement. Finally, our moderator today is Dr. Ralph Sauer. He's the deputy head of DG Justice's unit for international data flows and protection at the European Commission. He's been one of the key negotiators of the EU-US Privacy Shield and is, in, is involved in the adequacy talks with Japan and Korea. Ralph has also represented the Commission in negotiations on the modernization of Council of Europe Convention 108. He holds an LLM and a doctoral degree from Yale Law School. I invite our guests to join us on the panel. Thank you. Okay, um, so thank you, Aaron, for uh, introducing everybody, and including me. Um, and I can say that uh, I'm no longer negotiating the uh, Japan adequacy because it's, uh, uh, we have adopted the decision, so that, that's, a, that's a good thing, uh, good news of last week. Um, uh, as you all know, uh, we, we just had uh, Data Protection Day, so, and, and, and you probably also know that this uh, celebrates uh, the birthday of the, the opening for signature of, of uh, the Council of Europe Convention 108, uh, so the, the only international uh, agreement uh, on, on data protection, uh, and, and uh, which in the meantime, uh, since it was opened uh, for signature in, in the 80s, uh, has more than 53 uh, parties from around the world. Uh, so you see that there is a clear uh, trend of, 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 uh, of convergence, uh, which comes from uh, international law, from, from an international convention, uh, which, which uh, has an increasing membership. Uh, but we have also seen in, in recent years uh, a number of other developments around uh, the world, uh, both at regional level and at, at national level. Uh, at regional level, um, we have, for instance, um, in, uh, well, of course, uh, 
Uh, since we're here, I, I can start uh, with the EU's development. Uh, we have reformed our law, so a big block of, of countries uh, have, have uh, now uh, a harmonized set of rules uh, and, and, and uh, in, in a way uh, different from the past. That it's no longer just a framework law, it's really a, a harmonized uh, a statute in a way for the entire EU. But you have also other regions, uh, Latin America, we have the Ibero-American standards uh, which were for data protection, which were uh, developed uh, over the last couple of years and, 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 and adopted, uh, accepted uh, last year. Um, and that's, although it's soft law, it's, it's, it's a, a common set of rules uh, for all of uh, Latin America. We have in Africa uh, the African Union um, Convention on Cybersecurity and Personal Data Protection. Um, uh, and uh, we uh, have a number of uh, national developments, uh, and uh, there we can also then uh, turn to, to Asia, where uh, although there's no regional uh, uh, law or, or convention, um, we see nevertheless uh, a lot of interesting developments which um, and that's what, what we want to then discuss further, seem to be going uh, in the same direction. Uh, I mentioned at the very beginning uh, Japan, um, uh, where uh, the data protection law was um, uh, reformed uh, in 2017, uh, and uh, on that basis then the European Union engaged uh, in, in inadequacy talks with uh, Japan. Uh, it's a very modern law um, uh, that, that uh, is... Uh, uh, now, uh, horizontal law with uh, a data protection uh, authority. Um, we have uh, in Korea, uh, of course, for quite some time, uh, a data protection law, but a lot of reforms and amendments in recent years. Uh, and from what we know, also new developments, uh, uh, an attempt to uh, create also an independent uh, authority now uh, for the general data protection law with uh, all the uh, investigatory enforcement powers. We have. Uh, in Indonesia uh, developments, uh, the drafting uh, of a law which will hopefully uh, soon see the light and, and we will also talk about that. Uh, and then of course also India, uh, very interesting, um, triggered uh, among other things I guess but, but to a, a strong uh, extent uh, by uh, a Supreme Court judgment, uh, the Putaswami uh, judgment which uh, created um, or at least spelled out for the first time the, the fundamental right uh, to data protection and then following this um, the development uh, of a draft law under the leadership uh, of Justice uh, Sri Krishna. Um, so there are a lot of um, uh, developments um, and, and, and you, ca you could mention more, Thailand, Pakistan, they're all uh, reforming the laws. So it's, it's a very interesting moment uh, to see uh, whether these laws are uh, taking a common approach, is this going in the same direction, is there uh, is there a level of convergence uh, which, uh, even without a regional coordination, is nevertheless uh, uh, signaling <coughs> a certain trend? Uh, and that's, that's uh, what we wanted to discuss today. And, and I think there's no better person to, to kick that off as, uh, than Clarice, uh, since she has, um, at her research institute, studied all of this, uh, uh, what's, what is going on in, in the Asia region as a whole, so um, I would ask you maybe to, to kick off, uh, give us um, an overview of, uh, I mean, beyond what I just said, uh, um, uh, so what's, what's, what's happening in the region and, and, and how do you see that, that development? Thanks, Ralph. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for making it over to here. It was not so easy to find, um, so we're really pleased to see you all. Um, well, indeed, I've been uh, working over the last um, nearly three years um, over that project on the <coughs> convergence of data protection laws in Asia, data privacy laws in Asia, um, working on 14 jurisdictions more specifically. Um, so my institute is not tied to any government, so we're, you know, I can't say exactly what's going to happen in the name of the Singaporean government in particular, so don't look at me as representing Singapore, but more as someone who's been observing the evolution of all those laws over the past two years. Um, it's pretty crazy at the moment in Asia. Um, the laws are changing everywhere. Uh, there's a frenzy of regulations. Um, countries are very different. Um, so the reason why data protection laws are moving might be very different from one country to another. Um, so I would say there are three types 
of countries. You've got countries like uh, Japan, Korea, um, Hong Kong that have had Australia, New Zealand, if you count them as Asians, um, that have data protection laws in place for, you know, they've had it for a long time, fairly sophisticated systems. Um, they're more or less upgrading their laws at the moment to adapt them to the 21st century um, and in part under the influence, obviously, of GDPR. Um, there are countries with no proper data protection laws in place, but with lots of data protection provisions already in place, like typically in India and Indonesia. And these countries are also moving in the same direction of having comprehensive data protection laws, but you shouldn't underestimate the difficulties of going through that process. I mean, <coughs> Sinta can tell us about Indonesia later. Um, and then you've got other countries where officially data protection matters, but there are no um, clear movements in the direction of having a data protection law. So that's typically a country like Vietnam, uh, so other countries in Southeast Asia where data protection is officially important, but it's not a priority um, in some countries where you've got so many more things to deal with. Um, and then there's China, which is one of a kind, we haven't mentioned, but there are very interesting developments in China. Um, I think the key, um, the key common point there is that data protection matters. Um, it matters not necessarily, um, it didn't start in all countries, a bit like in Europe, where it's a human rights based approach. Um, the reasons why many countries are moving in the direction of having data protection laws is clearly a trade um, issue. And it's part and parcel of the objective of making a number of countries turn into AI hubs, data analytics hub. There's great competition in the region, it's the biggest region in the world, right, with two countries that are continents in themselves that basically process data within the region and want to attract business. So there's a, an Asian-specific debate on data protection and privacy that is taking place around, mostly revolving around trade issues. Uh, we can't underestimate the importance of issues of digital sovereignty, um, hence the discussion around data localization in particular and the notion of national security, et cetera. Um, that's very important um, in Asia. This notion of digital sovereignty is really um, taking off, and I think we can discuss that about data localization later. Broad picture. So just factors of convergence. Um, convergence, the word is important. We shouldn't talk about harmonization. I was told <coughs> it was a, a bad European word. We can't hope for harmonization in the long term. So convergence is good enough because we're starting from very far away. Um, GDPR is one factor. So um, there are lots of common principles between the laws, um, whether you call them Convention 108 or whether it's the APEC privacy framework or the OECD guidelines. They roughly, you know, the laws roughly more, more or less look the same. The challenge tomorrow will be implementation, and this is where I see divergence coming back in again, uh, frankly. Um, the laws are different, the regulators um, are different, and uh, we cannot expect Asian countries with different cultures, traditions, religions, um, implementing European standards per se just because they have adapted you know, their laws to match GDPR. Um, so that's the next step. Maybe we can discuss that later. I'll stay here for now. Okay. Um, thank you very much. Uh, indeed, uh, even even in Europe, uh, uh, harmonization is, is is not always a, a favorite word. Um, uh, and certainly, uh, I think uh, across countries, uh, that that's not what's what's happening. Um, uh, but but indeed, it's it's interesting to to see uh, uh, nevertheless whether there are common trends. Uh, and so, um, uh, would be then. Interested to hear, uh, since we have uh, luckily um, representatives from from three of these uh, countries uh, with us um, that that are directly involved, uh, also in uh, in the legal developments there uh, when it comes to data protection. So, if um, if I would start with uh, you, uh, uh, Justice Sh Krishna, if you could. Uh, Give us a bit uh, of an update as to um, what has happened uh, in <coughs> India um, since the Putaswami judgment, maybe, uh, and 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 uh, where the country is now, and 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 how you see this 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 going forward. Uh, so far, we have seen uh, uh, the draft law that you prepared, but uh, would be interesting to know what's what's now the debate around it, uh, and and where is it going? Thank you, Ralph. Uh, uh, a very good, warm. Greeting to all my friends here and in the audience, despite the inclement weather, 
all of you have gathered here. <coughs> as far as India is concerned, the whole issue was kicked off by the attempt of the Indian federal government to, in, to institute what we call the Aadhaar number, namely the unique identification number. Some of the activists challenged it on the ground that it was a breach of the privacy of the citizens. Now that gave rise to another debate as to whether privacy was a fundamental right at all. The Supreme Court constituted a large bench to examine that issue in depth because there were a number of conflicting earlier judgments. And finally, in the celebrated case of Puttaswami, which uh, Ralph referred to, <coughs> there was this decision given by the Supreme Court that right to privacy is a fundamental right. Having arrived at that, then the next question is, how do you guarantee the right to privacy? Under what circumstances can you restrict it? Who can restrict it? What is the modus for restricting it? And the circumstances that have to be decided. Now, therefore, in order to take stock of the situation, the government of India constituted a high-powered committee of experts, uh, of which I was the only non-expert who had chaired the committee. And then we deliberated it for about uh, almost two, two years, I think about 18 months and 19 months, we produced uh, a report. But before that, I must tell you <coughs> what we did was interesting. We produced what we called a white paper, giving a survey of the data protection law all over the world, pointing out the various options that would be available with us. We also put it in the public domain and invited public uh, reaction from it. And I personally toured around the country and at least in the major metropolises, holding public meetings, inviting public to give their uh, inputs on that. Look, took on board all the inputs and finally a draft, uh, a report together with a draft bill which would give the basic contours of the private, uh, the data protection law was submitted to the government sometime at the end of July of last year. Now, <coughs> the government of India, <coughs> the latest development as of yesterday, I heard that the government is thinking of introducing a parliamentary bill in the parliament in the coming session, a uh, budget session, which is going to start from Monday, I believe. And uh, my own guess is that uh, data protection law is too complicated to be debated and rushed through in a short, uh, lame duck session. So probably they will again send it to a standing committee of the parliament to examine it in great detail. And uh, if I'm not wrong, I'm sure the parliament will summon me to come and give evidence before the parliamentary committee that is for the future. But as of today, the wheels are moving and the law is on the anvil. And I expect in the short period that we see, the law will become uh, come into force. But there is a, a long period of gestation because everybody cannot suddenly start implementing the law from tomorrow if the law becomes operative today. So a period of almost two and a half years would be available for people to trim their sails, readjust their sites, and to rework their uh, computer softwares to comply with the law. Now, generally talking about the law, <coughs> uh, Clarice and I had a long debate some time ago in Singapore, when I met her in Singapore. Every student of international law will agree that sovereignty has been established by each state on separate counts, territorial sovereignty, sovereignty with regard to the, the territorial waters, space, and no environment. And each one of them, every state says, I'm sovereign and you can't do anything about it. My law governs this issue. Now, if everyone were to behave like that in this world, the world would result in chaos. That's why we had the League of Nations, the United Nations, who may not harmonize it, but at least ensure that there is some kind of a working mechanism wherein the sovereignty of one does not clash with the sovereignty of other. That's why you have the Kyoto Convention, you have the, the GATT, you have the WTO, and you name it. Now, I envision that in future, data protection will become a thorny issue with each country saying that my data sovereignty is something that I will not compromise upon, in which case some kind of an acceptable standard will have to be laid down. And that can come down either by bilateral negotiations or by some kind of a multilateral negotiated settlement 
which is on the lines of the UN Convention. And if that happens, then you do not have these complicated issues like whose data is it, where should it be localized, what, under what circumstances can it be allowed to cross the border. These are thorny issues because each government has taken its own view in the matter. Speaking for the Indian uh, point of view, I would say that we have taken the view that data localization is necessary because of several reasons given out in the report to which we may uh, refer to in a little bit little later during the discussion. So I see the writing on the wall, but how far the wall is from me, I am unable to tell you right now. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I would, of course, be interested uh, to to know, I mean, uh, I don't know whether you, you are privy to this, but uh, um, in the committee that that uh, drafted the, uh, the bill, let's say, um, uh, there were, of course, I think, uh, already a number of, of uh, representatives from the government uh, present, um, among others. Um, does that suggest that um, the uh, the law, which is then uh, or the, the proposal uh, for a law, which would then be introduced uh, into Congress, uh, it might be relatively close to uh, the draft law that that you uh, in the committee had had uh, sent to the government, or or will it uh, could it be very different from from uh, what what came out? Well, of sharing several such government committees, high-powered commissions, as they call them. And speaking from my experience, ultimately, whatever the commission or the committee of experts says, somebody in the government tweaks it, chops it, turns it, and what comes out may not necessarily be exactly what the report is. That I am sure, because that's what my experience told me. Now, I hear also, fortunately here, I have seen a draft of the bill that is sought to be introduced. Uh, there are some changes, but not very serious changes which would affect the total tone of the draft bill that we had uh, formulated. But I don't know what will happen before the standing committee, what will then be redrafted, and what will happen during the parliamentary debate. I can only guess about it. And I also await with bated breath as to what's going to come out ultimately. Sure. Um, that, that's, that's very clear, and, and um, just wanted to have your educated guess. Uh, let's see what what uh, the final shape, uh, well, I mean, the final shape will be after it goes into Congress, so I guess uh, um, that might also uh, be subject to, to uh, a number of changes, but uh, so at least at government level, it, it's, it's maybe going to be very close to, to, um, to what you had drafted or your committee. Um, so then let's maybe uh, uh, for, for a bit turn to Korea, um, where we also uh, with uh, Unique have, have uh, somebody who um, knows very well, of course, uh, what has happened in, in, the, in the last couple of years. And, and uh, I would be interested to, to understand a bit of what the dynamic was in, in the last couple of years. Because, I mean, you have this law already uh, since, uh, I think, 2011, as I said. Um, but, but then um, I think uh, the Korean government and, and, and parliament is not shy in, 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 in adapting it uh, uh, relatively often and regularly. Um, and I think uh, it, it, that shows that, that uh, um, either uh, Korea was, uh, I don't know, uh, faced with a number of challenges that, that, that needed to, to be addressed, or that, um, and, and maybe both, uh, that uh, you also have perhaps looked around a bit uh, in other developments that, that took place, uh, and, and, and on that basis thought that uh, it's, it's maybe necessary to, to further uh, adapt a lot. What, what what has happened in, 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 in Korea in the, in the last couple of years? And then uh, how do you see the prospect uh, for this latest uh, change, which uh, draft change which has been introduced, uh, namely to, um, in a way, uh, move the powers uh, from the ministry, uh, which is currently the one that enforces uh, the Personal Information uh, Protection Act, to... Uh, the PIPC, which is the the, the supervisor, the independent uh, supervisory authority. Um, uh, can you enlighten us a bit uh, as to uh, what has happened and and and, and what will uh, perhaps happen this year? Sure. Sure. Thank you. Uh, uh, you know how many of you know Korea? I d I'm not sure <laughs> how many we know about that, but Korea uh, is a small country. Uh, when it says it's territory, but its population is not that small country. It's over 15 million, compared to its small sizes. 
And there is no, I mean, abundant natural resources at all. So we, we surely depends, up, depends upon trade. I mean, trade is, a, trade, I mean, Korea's <coughs> trade dependence is over 60%. So we cannot survive with others outside in the world. So we, very, uh, we are very uh, cautiously uh, approaching these kind of problems, uh, especially to data transfer. Nowadays, we are talking with European commissions to talk about the adequate decisions. It made a lot of difference in Korea because we don't have any, I mean, independent supervisory agencies <coughs> right now. It's actually, uh, the independent standards in GDPR is a little bit difficult to understand in Korea. I mean, a lot of people in Korea don't understand why we are not independent. We do it very well. We do, I mean, without any uh, intervention of, I mean, president or other people, or civil society, or companies. But the regulation said we need some kind of budgetary independence or stepping independence. Actually, I'm a government employee. Uh, so all of our, I mean, uh, agency steps are government employee in Korea, except KISA, which is, I mean, semi-government agencies. They are doing some kind of uh, subsidiary things from, uh, ordered from KCC or MOIS, which is Ministry of Industry, Interior or Korean Communications Commissioners. So uh, nowadays we are I mean, talking about this independent situation, uh, making a one independent supervisory uh, agency, I mean, which is my commission, Personal Information Protection Commission, uh, will be uh, the only one uh, data protection agency in Korea sooner or later. If the, I mean, the amendment bill uh, is admitted by parliament. So it depends on the situation, but uh, right now, the government, I mean, President Moon already accepted that. There was uh, some kind of, I mean, uh, agreement between governmental uh, authorities, such as Korean Communication Commissions and Ministry of Inter Interior and uh, Financial <coughs> Service Commission too. So we already set up I mean, in terms of governmental area, but uh, the problem is in Parliament, as all European parliaments do like that. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, I think uh, GDPR is kind of, I mean, privacy, uh, renaissance, as we did all time, a long time ago in, from Italy. They make some kind of, I mean, human, I mean based on humanity, they make some kind of spirits and cultures from, from the humanity. So GDPR, uh, I mean, uh, expects the humanity, which is privacy. So this trend is desirable, but specific methods or mechanism is a little bit, uh, I mean, different all over the world. I mean, the countries face the, their traditional uh, cultures or registration is all different from with, with each other. So we should think about that. And Korea is, uh, how can I say, it's very, uh, people in Korea don't like, uh, government employee. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's something we also know from <laughs> Europe, uh, very well. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so we made some kind of registration. They hate it because all we, make, all we made is some kind of nuisance to them. So we want some kind of global, st global standard, standardization, just like GDPR. So nowadays, everyone in Korea uh, adults, adults, I mean, uh, no, no, I mean professionals or pro professors or lawmakers do love <coughs> GDPR because it makes a sense to people. I mean, the European countries, uh, over 28 countries, uh, respect these rules. So we should follow this. That's kind of trend in Korea. I mean, uh, it's the same, I think, goes on to in Japan or other countries too. So, <laughs> so uh, the motivation of uh, revision is from GDPR, but there are some factors uh, like uh, economic situation. 
there is some kind of um, controversial issues in Korea, uh, which is related to data linkage between uh, different areas. So it was uh, probably uh, in, uh, influenced to uh, our new revised law, which is, uh, which is going to be uh, enforced sooner or later. So this kind of issues is come from uh, industry of I mean, data. So they were asked this kind of things. So uh, we admit that at the same level with I mean, GDPR does, just like Article 89, uh, except I mean, scientific or historical research or other things. So it goes on like that. So I want to quit right now because I already talk about too much. <laughs> so. Oh, no, no, thank you. Uh, not at all, and, and thank you very much for that. Uh, just uh, on the on the independent authority, um, uh, does it uh, play a role that uh, because we have another law, of course, in 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 Korea, which is the Network Act, uh, has a much longer title, but but in short, it's the Network Act, which which uh, regulates, I guess, the um, uh, information service providers uh, and, and 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 network operators. Uh, and it has uh, data protection rules, and it also has, uh, with the KCC, uh, an independent uh, supervisory authority with full powers. Um, and and my understanding, at least, is that uh, within Korea, um, the Network Act, as a uh, special law, in a way, compared to the general data protection law, already covers a lot of the activities uh, of, of operators uh, in Korea. So. Uh, does that mean that it shouldn't be such a big step to then uh, uh, expand that further and, 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 and have it also for people for, for the general data protection law? Mm, actually, uh, the network uh, is it's going to be absorbed into PIPA in Korea, and that's which is Personal Information Protection Act and general law in Korea uh, in terms of uh, data protection. So. Right now, we have some kind of, I mean, uh, chemical, there, there's no chemical, I mean, unification. Just, I mean, uh, how can I say, physical <laughs> consolidation is already uh, done, but we are continuing to study about how can we uh, make this as a, on one unified law in Korea. Uh, there are another laws in Korea, I mean, the credit reporting called Act in Korea too, so, and geolocational uh, protection, uh, data protection, protection code, so it's very difficult to, uh, I mean, unify whole of things, in, uh, I mean, in legislation uh, stage, so uh, the things are, are, I mean, independence of KCC is a little bit, little bit uh, different from uh, other ministry of, I mean, uh, interiors or uh, the Ministry of Justice. Uh, KCC is a uh, kind of um, organization which is subordinate to presidential office. They do their work independently, but the law says they can do that. But uh, actual situation is a little bit different. I mean, they are one of the uh, I mean composer of the national, I mean, governmental uh, meetings. So it depends on mm, how can you see that. They are one of the member, but they can do that very independently. So it's a kind of or, uh, oriental system is really, really different from uh, EU's or United States. They are one of, I mean, ombudsman, just like ombudsman in, uh, the system is, um, the system ombudsman is not uh, really exist in Korea. Because we, we don't believe anyone who can survive uh, who are not government employees. <laughs> so it's kind of different situation. Okay, so uh, and I, and I think that that's uh, maybe also something that we sh will take, talk about a bit. Uh, uh, what 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 are actually the let's say. Uh, cultural parameters which are maybe a bit different uh, or the the administrative traditions uh, that are a bit different uh, which then also of course uh, in, in all areas of law and, and therefore also in the area of data protection law uh, then lead to certain different solutions uh, uh, than, than, than we have for example here or in other parts uh, of the world um, uh, let's let's move on to to Indonesia uh, again uh, a country where uh, interesting uh, developments are 
taking place. Um, uh, I think there have been in the past already some attempts to to uh, adopt a, a data protection law. Um, I think they 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 have then sort of become dormant uh, uh, later on. Uh, they were never, I think, uh, put into law. Uh, but I think now there is a push to to. Uh, to really do it, uh, and 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 uh, I think it's relatively uh, far developed, but would be interesting uh, to to hear from Sinta um, where what's the what's the state of play and 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 and, and what's the the way forward. Okay, thank you for uh, the opportunity for me to explain uh, how Indonesia uh, development of. Uh, having data protection bill. Uh, just for introduction, like in uh, many uh, developing countries, we don't have uh, legal culture about privacy. The privacy doesn't have a strong tradition in Indonesia itself. However, however the attitudes uh, are then gradually changing because uh, Indonesia also bound by international human rights instrument. Uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights and ICCPR has already been uh, ratified by uh, national legislation. So the basic regulation actually uh, is in place uh, and also we, we look into the practices of other countries within Asian region as you know Malaysia, Singapore, Philippines and Thailand also in the process of uh, having the bills and also uh, Vietnam. So Indonesia is what Ralph said is uh, like a moody. Sometimes it's very slow, but sometimes it's very strong. So uh, me as an academia who recommended to my government to should have this regulation sometimes, uh, I also confused, you know, where, uh, where are going, uh, where, where will we going to have the law or not? So, uh, but uh, after we have so many cases, uh, because Indonesia just launched uh, electronic identity card program, which is adopted from India. It was uh, launched like four years ago, and then we have. Uh, uh, the Facebook cases and we also have the GDPR and the government suddenly like have uh, wake up uh, in this case the ICT ministry and then the ministry, ministry mentioned that we should have this law. So actually in Indonesia uh, we have several sectoral uh, regulation in place. Uh, for instance we have Electronic Information Transaction Act in 2008 which is in those regulations, we have one article that specified that data protection will be protected, but it's only in one article. And it doesn't say how the people will uh, claim if you know their privacy was, uh, intr uh, was uh, intrusive by uh, the parties, and it's not clear. So when uh, I propose that we should have a very specific uh, data protection law five years ago, and the uh, ICT ministry says, okay, you uh, let's make an academic draft first because Indonesia in be able to have regulation, uh, the government should have uh, academic draft first, uh, the justification from the academia, uh, why we need this law. So after this draft law, uh, this academic draft finished being draft by uh, us, and then uh, the government be became uh, make uh, draft the uh, data protection law. It it finished uh, two years ago, but then uh, I think in the ministry itself, in the ICT ministry, it's very hard to coordinate because each of directorate have very different perspective. Sometimes in the directorate of uh, inform public information uh, who deal with the regulation and then it's transferred to other directorate and then transferred to the other directorate. So never settle <coughs> within the ministry of ICT itself. And then when the case 
Facebook case arising when I, s I use GDPR to, you know, to push the government, you should have this law. We have this GDPR and then the Ministry of ICT say, okay, we're going to finish this law. And uh, up until now, the law itself uh, uh, having conducted several harmonization because in Indonesia we should, we will, uh, the government should have a several harmonization. And one of the problem uh, for my perspective is with the Ministry of Home Affairs, uh, where we have the uh, electronic identity card program who doesn't want to be comply with this regulation. They say it's, we don't have any, that we don't need any data protection bill because we already have uh, this administrative regulation in place. But then the ministry start to negotiate and then last month, uh, finally the Ministry of Home Affairs say yes, okay, we're going to be a support of this regulation. But until now, uh, still there's no move to be submit to the parliament. Actually, the parliament itself waiting, as my surprise, waiting for the government to submit this regulation to them. The minister of ICT uh, says to me uh, last, last week, they said they're going to submit by the end of January. And Ralph said, when? because it's already been the end of January, so <laughs> I, I, I don't know the, the, uh, what is the problem, but I think one of the main problem is uh, how we're going to establish the independent supervisory bodies, which is doesn't have support from other ministry who say, well, Indonesia have too many commission, we don't need any commission, and then we, uh, we try to solve this problem and then up until now, I said to them that we should have independent commission if we're going to have a, a harmonize this regulation, but they said no, we, we cannot have other commission. And then uh, until now, uh, the commission will be like similar with maybe Singapore and, and uh, uh, last time and, uh, and Malaysia which is under the Ministry of, of ICT. So uh, there was no, uh, no, uh, uh, no development uh, where it's going to be submitted to the, to the parliament. Thank you. Okay, um, thank you very much for, for that update. Um, so if we then look a bit uh, more sort of horizontally as, as to uh, what, what do we see in terms of, of convergence, uh, and maybe also where do we see certain differences? Uh, and I think it would also be interesting actually to know, I mean, w are there uh, uh, principles, obligations, rights developing, which, which maybe we don't have, uh, which are uh, novel uh, uh, ideas that, 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 that spring from, from the developments uh, in Asia and, and the reflection about uh, data protection. So uh, maybe again, uh, uh, start uh, with Clarice uh, uh, at the beginning. Um, uh, do you see, I mean, is there an overall uh, trend of, of convergence? Uh, also interesting, I think, to, to hear um, that, that independent authorities uh, seem to be sometimes a point where there is a lot of debate whether to do that or not. Uh, and maybe that has to do with uh, certain traditions that, 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 that are different. Um, and, and, and then, yeah, are there other things that you see which, which are actually novel ideas uh, that, that uh, where, where the rest of the world can, can, can learn then also from, from what's happening in Asia. Um, just a, com a quick comment after listening to these national uh, experiences. It's interesting because the same thing happens you know, in all countries. Um, basically, all governments say, we're going to update you know, our data protection law, we're going to upgrade it, uh, we need quickly. Uh, or we need a data protection law quickly because now data countries with no data protection laws really look like they're lagging behind. And so the original intention is quick and then you sort of get dragged in the sand, you know, in the desert. Because um, the first challenge, I think, so I'm not addressing your question, but it's, it's important to identify the principles to jump on to possible solutions. Um, in contrary to Europe, where we don't need to discuss why we need data protection, it is necessary to have that discussion in each and every Asian country. Why do you need a data protection law? And what's complicated in Asia, 
on top of the fact that there is no coordinating body like the EDPB or you know wherever, um, there is a necessity to absorb within a few years all the complexities that have developed in Europe and in the US and elsewhere over decades. So that's really the complexity. You need a data protection law because it's, it's good, obviously, for your population because you have national identification scheme developing, so you need data protection rules to, to shape that. But then some countries are very reluctant to have laws covering the public sector, so it's, it's difficult to launch that discussion. Um, you've got the trade component, and then countries say they want convergence, but at the same time, they derive advantage from being sort of safe havens for data, so, you know, differentiating themselves from other countries by having strong data protection laws in place. So that's a bit of an obstacle to convergence, because then you destroy the competitive advantage. Um, there is the, um, the question, again, of digital sovereignty, but more generally, um, we shouldn't underestimate the importance of geopolitics in the region, with data being so intrinsically linked to trade. And you know that there are a few disputes in the region, in Asia nowadays, and that has a huge impact on the way governments approach the development of a data protection law and a data localization law and a cybersecurity law at the same time. Because as uh, Unix said, many countries are basically dependent, their survival in Asia depends on their capacity to trade with all the countries in the region and beyond, and that includes <coughs> China for many countries, especially in Southeast Asia. So that's a very complicated landscape. Nevertheless, um, there is a reason for hope, um, I would say. The regulators that are in place actually increasingly cooperate, especially in the context of the Asia Pacific um, Privacy Authorities Forum, so that's a positive development. You see more and more um, data governance, um, sorry, governments or ministries with data protection responsibilities that are sort of having more weight within the government because the traditional problem is that um, MCIs, Ministry of Communication and Information, that are tasked with the development of such laws are usually not as strong, obviously, at the ministries of justice, of home affairs, or, or trade, or whatever. So the, the coordination process is really hard. And but data, data breaches, GDPR, I mean, there have been massive data breaches in, in, in Asia these last years and these last month, and including, um, you know, uh, from files that are more or less under the responsibility of governments like health records, etc. So that has pushed government into having a wider discussion, um, including with their neighbors. Um, there is more cooperation between regulators and governments um, than is maybe publicly known, but it is uh, taking place. Um, I think the question of um, a regulator, and I'll, I'll close on this, having an independent regulator um, is not a natural Asian thing um, at all. Um, the notion of an independent regulator in data protection, which is fairly new, I think that's the double obstacle. So um, I guess Having an independent regulator in the, in the trade sector is something which is clearly unvisitable. Um, having an independent regulator covering uh, the public sector is a huge challenge, and I think that's one of the reasons why things are lagging behind in Indonesia. Um, if you look at a country like Thailand, and this is where you can see there's hope, I would say, um, Thailand, the data protection bill has remained dormant for years and it had become a joke, kind of, oh, Thailand, you know, didn't think about it. And then all of a sudden, within six months, there was a bill, public consultation on the bill, first reading, and actually the bill is now in, in parliament and should be voted before the election. It's a big election year in Asia, in many different countries, right? Including, <laughs> including India, including Indonesia, including many countries. So, um, and that <coughs> bill actually covers the public sector and there will be a set of independent bodies, maybe too many, um, but that's an interesting development because nobody had seen that coming. So it is possible in Asia to have a comprehensive law with an independent regulator in place. So it's, you have to look at it um, both globally and then country by country because there is no, you need, so you have to look from the ground up, and it's very difficult to impose solutions from outside because there's no overarching body. So there is hope, 
but everything will take time, <laughs> a lot of time. Yes, <laughs> that's the problem. Um, yeah, uh, that's an interesting uh, thought. I think that we, 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 we didn't discuss this, that, that of course, uh, indeed, there, there is always the question, data protection for what? Uh, whether it's just the commercial sector or it's also the, the, the public sector. Uh, and, and interestingly enough, uh, I indeed, uh, when it comes to the public sector, uh, resistance might actually be higher um, than than uh, than we talk about uh, the commercial sector. I just wanted to to, to still dwell at least one second on on, on my my question, um, uh, which I have not answered, um, <laughs> on on uh, whether you see um, sort of new uh, innov innovative uh, uh, things uh, emerging that that. That are maybe also interesting for for a European audience uh, because I mean it's not that we have uh, a monopoly on on good ideas. Uh, so is there something that you see? Whoa! Um, <laughs> I can't say there are still lessons to be learned from Asia um, in Europe. Um, what I find personally interesting is that. Uh, governments are getting up to scale fairly quickly on data protection and they're able to sort of pick and choose what they find um, useful in the context of their own reform for data protection law. So typically in Singapore, what the act covers at this stage only the private sector. Um, well, data portability is interesting. So they, they took data portability, it's a very much a, a, a trade approach, consumer you know, protection approach. So we take this, we take um, data breach notification, and we combine all this in a general framework for digital data governance that goes beyond personal data. Um, that's interesting. Um, there is also the idea that you can take ideas from outside and then adapt it locally. So for instance, again, in Singapore, there is a uh, regulatory sandbox for data protection. We don't, frankly, I don't really know where that is going. They, they took it from the ICO in the UK, and they're actually moving further on their own program than the ICO itself in the UK. So um, I can't say there are many things to learn um, per se and to import um, into, uh, into Europe. I'm impressed myself uh, with the, the energy and the, the willingness to embrace all this complexity and, and to deal with it um, you know, firsthand. I mean, it's it's really impressive. So there is one debate which is sort of starting here and there, which is the deba debate on AI and ethics. So it's not directly related to data protection again, but it is taking off. Um, there is now a whole program on AI and ethics in Singapore, which is very advanced and very interesting. It is taking off in China also. We haven't talked much about China, but it's a really interesting country to look at. Um, so even not coming from the same rationales. I mean, the, the lo local developments, um, there's always something to, to learn from them. Um, f as a European, for instance, and again, I'm not addressing your question directly, but I think it's interesting. As a European, I've, it, it took me a while, but I've given up looking at Asia from a European angle, because then you, you miss um, a lot of the point. It is possible <coughs> in Asia to develop a data protection law by looking at it from a purely trade angle or from a pure cybersecurity angle. It's weird for us, but it works there. They, they get it started from another ground. So I'm not addressing your question directly, but algorithmic decision making, for instance, is not necessarily dealt with in a data protection law, but will be approached elsewhere. That's interesting. Um, may maybe uh, if, if any of the other um, distinguished speakers have, have uh, thoughts on this, I mean, how do you, how do you see uh, convergence? Uh, is, is there convergence around a, a certain model? Are there things which, which uh, are a bit different, um, maybe owed to, to um, specific contexts, specific circumstances in, uh, in, in the country? And, and do you see things which were maybe... Uh, looking around the world, you have actually f further developed uh, uh, um, concepts uh, or come up with new uh, uh, ideas, additional protections that, that, are, that may be interesting. See, the Indian, Indian view has, was articulated long ago by Mahatma Gandhi, who said, keep your windows open so that the breeze from may come in, but make sure that the house doesn't get blown off. 
This is precisely what we have. This philosophy is this. Now, um, Clarice talked about uh, public uh, officials, public sectors not being covered by data protection law. We have ensured in the report that is submitted and the draft bill that every public official, including all government departments, would be covered by the data protection law and they would be answerable to a citizen who complains of breach before an independent law enforcer, the data protection uh, authority. Now, <clears throat> talking about the independence of regulators, there are so many regulators already in India. If you take, for example, this financial sector, the Reserve Bank of India has had a long uh, fight with the government of India that the government cannot tread on its toes and maintain its independence to a large extent. Then you have the capital market regulator who acts totally independently of the government. Then you have the foreign markets commission which acts independently of the government. And I don't see any reason why a data protection authority also cannot act independently of the government because if he has to ensure that there is no data, pre uh, data breach from the hands of a government official or from the hands of a public body, then he has to be jolly well independent and enforce it against the government. We have recommended in the bill that there should, like you know, for a uh, private company, certain percentage of its uh, overall global turnover as a penalty. But for government, it is difficult to do so. But we have been uh, recommended a steep penalty for the head of the department. And that, I think, should make them s sit up and take notice of the issue. And <coughs> we have had uh, re regulators who, uh, Ralph, ultimately, let me tell you one thing. The independence of the regulator is a function of the personality of the regulators. We have had good regulators, we have got bad regulators. Now, the law gives them a certain independence. The regulator must know, whoever is sitting in the chair, as to how to enforce it. If he does, it's good for the country. And we have not, and the philosophy that went into our um, draft bill uh, was adopted from the Supreme Court judgment. See, it's like a, there are three sides of a triangle. At the apex is the citizen and the fundamental right of the citizen to privacy. And one side, it is the state and the interest it has in maintaining the security of the state, which requires it to sometimes uh, 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 obtain data without the consent of the data um, person whose data you're taking. And then the other side, its impact on trade and commerce. Now, we have tried to keep a balance of these three forces and whatever the resultant is, as the mathematics will tell us, the law of triangular forces. And that will be ultimately the law that will be operative in India. Maybe, if not tomorrow, not day after, maybe one in the foreseeable future. Thank you very much. Um, you also don't want to, to, to actually tell me about uh, the what you have innovated, innovated, because I think, I mean, for example, I, I saw in, 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 in your bill there, there is, there's something about this score, uh, uh, yeah, sort of uh, definition score. I don't think we, I mean, uh, it's not something we have, it's something which, which... You know, otherwise what's going to happen is this concept of adequacy is something that is difficult to enforce. And therefore, we have thought of the data score. Not you deal with a company whose data score is high, like, you know, you can deal with a company who's, who has uh, marketed products which are branded by, the, we call them the Indian Standards Institution. There must be equally in America, equally in Europe. Whoever comes to this standard has a data score of, say, 10 out of 10 or 8 out of 10. That's a good company, therefore I deal with it. Somebody whose score is less than that, I think twice before dealing with it. That will encourage data privacy. It will act as a, some kind of a tidal force to ensure the public will enforce this diversity then. Because then every company will say, hey, I can't, product, I can't sell my products unless my data score is high. And that is independent of the regulation by the data uh, privacy regulator. This is something like uh, data internalizing of data privacy. That's something new that we have int uh, introduced in the bill. And hopefully it will work out there will be some kind of a data school platform maintained, that some kind of a data registry maintained in publicly, so that anybody can log in and say, X company, good, data scores. Now, for example, you have uh, Michelin rating for hotels, you have ratings for airlines, why not for data? Data privacy. Yes. 
Thank you. So um, that's that's uh, indeed something which uh, which is interesting. Uh, will certainly, be interesting to see then how how I mean, first of all, when it's in the final law, and then then how it how it will be applied. Um, Korea, I think I also uh, noticed that you 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 are thinking about uh, ways uh, uh, to deal uh, with anonymization or pseudonymization and and how this can be done if if uh, if you want to combine data from from uh, uh, different operators. Uh, so I think you, 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 that that's also something which might be an innovation, <coughs> which which uh, which is Korea specific. I don't know whether you uh, that this the, you want to say a few words about that or other things which which uh, you have developed in Korea. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. Uh, in Korea, uh, mm, the companies in Korea really wants the convergence of privacy. Act and global standard, just like GDPR uh, does in European society. Uh, because uh, in Korea, uh, what is particularly problematic, I problematic is the problem of uh, reverse uh, discrimination among domestic companies compared to uh, global companies in Korea. Uh, Korean law is, I mean, one of the stringent law in the world, I believe. Uh, some special listing. Uh, other countries just say, said like that. Uh, you can go to jail if you use the uh, personal data without permission of the individuals or uses that other purpose than the collecting. It's, uh, it's, it can be imprisoned up to five, five years, in, years in imprisonment. It's very uh, severe, harsh uh, I mean, sanctions to individual or company owners. So they always criticize this kind of, uh, I mean, strong uh, penalty to, I mean, domestic companies compared to global companies. Uh, actually, the uh, Korean government uh, has a difficulty in applying the Korean to global companies. Uh, and some of the domestic companies are receiving some unfavorable treatment from, from the competition. So they want to ask the convergence of global standard I mean, uh, legal regime in Korea too, compared to other countries, I mean, <laughs> just like EU countries. So the reason why I tell you this is the Article 80, 85 in GDPR. Uh, this regulation accepts, I mean, some kind of research purpose of uh, using data other than collecting purposes. So. It is a controversial issue in Korea. But nowadays, we studied about a lot about <coughs> ICO, UCAN in the United Kingdom. They made some kind of ADRN network. Uh, they, they, are, they made also the board to control that network, make some kind of, I mean, good benchmarking examples of data, I mean, uh, rankings. So we studied that a lot, and we want to make that as a, I mean, as a bill and the uh, PIP Act, but that's very difficult because civil so societies doesn't want that, don't, don't want that. They just uh, want their privacy keep kept very, I mean, safely without using, I mean, data linkages. So this, this, this is uh, our, our situation in Korea. Okay. Um, um, thank you very much. Uh, m maybe uh, uh, before then, uh, I think we should also then open it to to uh, the floor. Uh, maybe just one, one last question to 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 all of you, or whoever wants to answer it. Uh, um, what, what's the position then of stakeholders uh, in 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 your countries? I mean, who who is supportive uh, of uh, of data protection reform or strengthening data protection rules? Who, who is less so? Um, and, and and I guess that relates then to what are the benefits of of converging uh, and, and and having uh, a strong data protection law? Um, so what what. What have you, I mean, uh, certainly in India where you had a huge uh, public consultation, uh, I think you must have noticed sort of what, what are the forces at, uh, at, at work. Um. Uh, I, I found that the members of public, the individual uh, consumers, individual citizens are all for it. The only people who objected to it seriously, uh, uh, not very openly, but somewhat uh, covertly, were the multinational corporations operating in India because according to them, this is going to be death knell to trade and commerce. 
and to them my answer always was which law in which country has allowed you to operate freely everyone comes every law comes with a cost of business and take it in your stride it will work out it's like uh, buying a new pair of shoes after some time it will be very comfortable <laughs> very well yeah clarice i'm wearing new shoes <laughs> yeah, i'm familiar with that um <coughs> I think it really depends which country you're looking at, yeah. because again, Asia is huge. Every country has its own yeah. balance. Um, um, I think industry is pushing um, mainly um, the discussions on um, having a law or not. I think we're we're beyond that discussion now. Everybody says, okay, like like they've been a bit pushed back against GDPR. <laughs> now it's like GDPR is here, fine. You know, now how do we implement it? Um, there are some countries where civil society is really active. So that's definitely um, India, also in Australia. I mean, there are countries where these discussions happen because it's a public discussion um, and there are vigorous democracies. In other countries where data protection is new, you don't necessarily have a lot of uh, privacy activists or whatnot. But there is a general understanding that you need some form of data protection and somehow the latest data breaches that have been so massive have been the strongest you know, forms of advocacy for strong data protection laws um, in the region. So um, when you say industry, again, it's complicated because just like there's Asia and Asia, there's industry and industry. There are <coughs> different types of industry. What I find truly interesting is to see that typically Chinese industry is now stepping into the game when it is largely a US um, industry that was operating in the region and obviously local um, industry. And they do not necessarily see eye to eye on certain issues, like typically data localization in India, obviously huge pushback from the US industry because their business models rely on, you know, very large flow of data. Um, Chinese industry say, fine, we'll comply. We're happy with the Data Protection Act of India, you know. So, so you've got this discussion running. It's, it's very difficult. Uh, it really depends country per country and depending on the tradition, you know, whether you've got a strong culture of public debate or not. Can I say one more thing, uh, Ralph? <coughs> Look at how it works out. Now, the data protection law, the overarching data protection law has not still come into force. It has not passed through parliament. But the Reserve Bank of India issued one of those executive uh, orders which it is entitled to do under the Banking Regulation Act and said by definite deadline all payment systems operating in India, namely the Visa, MasterCard and the, and the like, must maintain their financial data pertaining to Indian residents in India on a local server. Of course, there was a whole of protest. But now Visa said, okay, we'll manage it. Then MasterCard said, okay, we'll manage it. The other one said, okay, give me some more time, I'll manage it. Oh, what happened to all the objections? How did, what happened to the cost of doing business in India? It got observed somewhere. It will happen ultimately. Now, oh. let's, let's hope that that's, that's not the pass forward, that, that sort of uh, industry accepts grudgingly uh, that, that uh, data localization is, is, is needed. Uh, but uh, presumably, uh, there, there, there should also be an interest, uh, of course, uh, of, of, of business, uh, of convergence uh, in the sense that uh, it makes it easier to operate across the, the region uh, if you have a very different uh, patchy landscape uh, that that will certainly make it uh, uh, more complex um, how's it in how do you see the situation in, in Indonesia well actually uh, the civil society who play in a very important roles in uh, raising uh, this issue and academia and uh, after this bill was uh, finished to draft, then the business will become very uh, to push this regulation. For them, is is important to have some certain legal certainty uh, about this law. So they pushing to have the the debate. But unfortunately, the ministry itself has has not yet been uh, established the engagement with uh, the business itself. Okay. Um, yeah, thank you very much. So I, I guess uh, since I, we probably need to end uh, in about seven minutes or so, um, so maybe we open it up for the, to the floor. And uh, although I cannot see anything here against the light, but there, there was a hand up uh, there. Might be Matthew, I don't know. Uh,
Good morning, Matthew Newman from MLEX. This is a question for the chairman from India. Uh, um, just wanted to get some more clarity on the timing for the introduction of the bill. Y you said uh, it's likely to go to a standing committee. And so does that mean that um, the introduction would be after the general elections in June? And once that happens, uh, the uh, can you give a estimate on how long it will be debated, or maybe that's too difficult to <laughs> to uh, to say. Uh, it's difficult to estimate the time required before the standing committee, because the standing committee probably will go into issues of evidence and summon some experts. Maybe you might be summoned as one of the experts to come and give evidence as to some of the nuances of the bill, and then. The standing committee will uh, reformulate the bill in in uh, coordination with the legislative wing, and that final bill would be put for uh, debate before parliament. And uh, if the interest that is shown by this government continues, and first of all, let me say, if this government in continues in power and the interest shown by them continues, then the next session should see it through. I don't think there is much difficulty. We should be given. Uh, somewhere in uh, May, June, with the next session, May, June of uh, th this year. But that is, again, hoping against hope, because parliamentary procedure is something over which nobody, not even the Supreme Court, has any control. <coughs> so, um, difficult to say who was next. Uh, I th well, okay, Clarice has, has it all uh, under control here. Good morning, my name is Wina and I'm from Leiden University, the Netherlands. I would like to ask a question for the speaker from Indonesia, Ms. Sinta Dewi. Uh, we understand that the draft bill for data protection in Indonesia is, uh, you know, has not progressed that much. Is there any um, s starting dialogue with the EU regarding the adequacy protection for Indonesia? Because we haven't yet to those uh, process because we haven't uh, finished the draft itself. So, uh, and I, I'm not sure that the adequacy will be the first priority for our government. The first thing that uh, we pass this law first, and then uh, we will see what happened in the in the next you know the, the next after we we pass the bill. The, the intention is the most important thing is for Indonesia is to pass the bill first, uh, because we are waiting for like five years to finish this bill, and then it hasn't been settled because there are no no agreement on how we going to have we we're going to have the independent supervisory body or not, and it take a lot of time to waiting for all the ministry to agree. So finally, we decide we, we should have this law first, and then let see what happened in the next after this law pass. Uh, same s what happened in Malaysia and Singapore because after they they passed the bill and then they they formed the independent su supervisory body. So the adequacy is still a long way no, long way to go. <laughs> Thank you. And of course, from the Commission side, uh, first of all, there has to be an expression of interest uh, from the country. That being said, uh, we, we are always interested uh, to engage uh, with countries, uh, in particular um, where there's a significant number of data flows. Uh, that's obvious, uh, because then we have an interest, of course, to, to ensure the protection uh, of, of the data. And also, um, if we have uh, trade negotiations, uh, which we have with Indonesia, uh, that, that can be an interesting parallel track. Uh, we've always said we, we don't discuss data protection in, 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 in trade negotiations, but uh, the adequacy route can be a parallel route to, to, uh, to trade talks. Um, but that's, in the end, of course, always up to uh, the country that, that, uh, that has to have an interest or not. Hi, my name is Shraddha. I'm a doctoral researcher at the Max Planck in Munich. My question is sort of um, something that uh, Clarice kept mentioning, that the uh, impetus in Asia is from a trade perspective. Uh, and then something that Ralph mentioned in the beginning, that we, we should know why 
really we need so to have convergence or to even start having these laws in the region we need to know why we need uh, data protection and then uh, I, I want to ask Clarice if you see that okay it will start from a trade uh, perspective but it, it, it involves a cultural sort of a renaissance in Asia with respect to data protection so do you see a linkage there? complicated. Trade is a common factor, but obviously country by country things differ. Obviously in India, the Putaswami judgment, you know, um, Already jumped it. yeah, had jumped it. I mean, privacy, fundamental right, protecting, you know, protected by the constitution. It's the case also in a number of countries. Um, you know, privacy is protected by the constitution of a number of, of um, Asian states. Um, <coughs> it is even qualified as a fundamental human right in a number of Asian states. So I'm not saying that the human rights discourse um, is not present. It is not predominant. Um, it is here, but it is not what is pushing convergence. The reason why the discussions on convergence are taking place is because business says rightly so that it's a nightmare to comply, you know, across Asia with all these data protection laws in place and the coordination with the sectoral laws, I mean, in all countries are just nightmarish. I mean, frankly, it's, it's just impossible, I think, to be 100% compliant. <laughs> so why is convergent important? I mean, there are many costs because of fragmentation. <coughs> The cost of getting familiar with the laws, that is a huge cost um, because you know you ask law firms to do the job for you, it costs your fortune. Um, there's a lot of legal uncertainty, so a lot of liability at stake and enforcement is taking off. So that's a serious matter. And then when you don't have convergence, it's harder for regulators to cooperate because when your laws do not have the same scopes, when the key definitions are not the same, um, when you don't even have a notion of data control or data processor in, in place in some countries, how do you cooperate? If the law doesn't cover data processors at all, how do you cooperate? So that's the discussion to have on convergence. So that doesn't really tie in with the rationale for the data protection law per se, I would say. Is, this, is there a mic here for the colleague here in the front? Ah, sorry. Hello, this is Yoka from Isamar. I was wondering, how do you see, um, in terms of enforcement, do you think uh, citizens are at all concerned about their privacy uh, within your countries? And if so, would they go to authorities or to complain? Do you see that happening? Uh, do you expect that to happen? So, any... Yeah, as far as I know it, yes, it will. Uh, with every new law that comes out, you have a mechanism for protecting the law, for implementing and monitoring uh, violations. Now, when that happens, obviously the citizens will complain. In fact, our uh, draft bill has a separate judicial forum, quasi-judicial quasi forum right up to the Supreme Court to deal with these data protection issues. And in fact, I was just now mentioning to Clarice and say, I do not know whether I'll be alive at that time, but I envision that somewhere in the future, you will have an international court of justice dealing with leaks, like a permanent court of arbitration which deals with trade and investment disputes. Because data sovereignty is going to be a big issue in the future. And people might even go to war on that unless you have a, an international body solving the problems. Sure. More modest comment. <laughs> um, in some countries, some citizens are actually extremely active. If you look at India, the Putaswami judgment oh, comes yeah. from, obviously, yeah. uh, former Justice Putaswami um, <coughs> introducing that claim. I don't know what the exact term, but in some countries, if you look at um, jurisprudence, case law, there's a lot, like in, in Korea, you'd be surprised the number of cases in the courts, um, you know, based on mainly the, the PIPA, um, sometimes yeah. the Network Act. Um, so there's, it's, it's very interesting. And if you look at... China, again, we haven't mentioned, you know, <laughs> people think China is a big black hole for privacy. Obviously, some things are, you know, surprising, let's say even disturbing for, you know, um, people coming, you know, from other countries. But there are lots of, there's a lot of case law at local level, you know, um, the courts are actually um, sanctioning, issuing criminal sanctions uh, for want of consent, intrusion of privacy, etc. There's a lot happening. One of the difficulties in Asia, which I'm confronted to every day, is that there is not so much public information out there. 
uh, very little in English. It's in, for the text themselves, you never know whether you have the right version. Um, Google Translate is great help, but you never, you don't really know whether you can trust everything that's thrown in there. So accessibility to um, to legal decisions in particular is is an issue. Okay, so then maybe this. And that's then probably the last question because yeah. then I think uh, Justice Sri Krishna, for example, has to go to another panel and maybe yeah, others right. as well. Okay, so I think this question is mainly for Ralph, but perhaps for the other panelists as well. So in the EU-Japan adequacy decision, it indicated that uh, you know overseas transfer to of data to companies based purely on their certification under uh, the APEC uh, CBPRs is kind of not acceptable. So I was just thinking on uh, because we've been discussing fragmentation in this panel. Are there what was the thinking behind that, and are there risks to relying on certification as a way to overcome fragmentation? Um, so, I mean, I think the clear answer for, for me would be no, it's not certification as such that is a problem. Uh, the, the question is what type of certification, how strong is it, uh, how, um, how closely is it uh, overseen and supervised, and, 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 and what are the individual rights that are guaranteed, what is the enforcement uh, behind it. And, and that's where we have a, uh, an issue uh, with CBPR. And, 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 uh, if CBPR would be strengthened, I think we, we would be all happy. Huh? But but uh, I think for the moment that's that's not the case, uh, at least in our assessment. Uh, and therefore, it created an issue for onward transfer, so uh, data transferred first from Europe to Japan and then onward to uh, one of the uh, one of the CBPR member uh, economies. Um, there aren't too many uh, uh, companies right now that, that that are certified, so I don't think this is this is a big issue for anyone. Um, but but we had to nevertheless uh, uh, say something about it uh, because that's clearly something which is a possibility under Japanese law in general. But uh, it will not be for for data transfer from Europe. So no, um, I mean we have certification uh, mechanisms in, in in the GDPR and in EU law. So clearly uh, we think that this is something which. Um, is is worth doing. Uh, it's 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 a way to ensure compliance, uh, but <coughs> under certain conditions. Uh, and that's why, for example, GDPR specifically refers to enforceable rights, uh, and that there is uh, a backup uh, uh, enforcement by uh, the data protection uh, authorities. Um, that that has to be in place, um, uh, and 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 I think that's that's where where the debate uh, will will have to take place. Okay, so um, I think. Uh, that was, from my perspective, certainly a very interesting debate, and I, I wanted to thank everybody, uh, all of the speakers, uh, to to come here and and and, and uh, go through the ordeal uh, of of questions. And uh, well, uh, also thanks to the audience, and uh, it was a good start. And and now let's let's uh, uh, continue with the conference in, in in other venues. Thank you very much. Thank you.